Welcome to Alabama Short Stories, when you're a little behind on your Alabama history. I'm your host, Sean Wright. The Avondale community of Birmingham has been going through a renaissance in the past decade. For years, the community seemed like an afterthought, a neighborhood you drove through to get to work or some other place. Citizens had been moving into homes and renovating them for some time, and artists already had studios in the area. But a little over a decade ago, business owners decided to take a chance on Avondale. They have opened up music venues, restaurants, and even a couple of breweries. The renaissance had started. Big Spring was well known to stagecoach drivers in the mid-19th century. Located near the junction of Georgia Road and Huntsville Road, it was proclaimed to have the sweetest waters in the region. The spring surfaced from a cavern that became accessible in the mid-1880s. Explorers at the time reported finding arrowheads and carved out niches, proof of ancient residence. A 20-foot deep crystal clear channel was described as well. Stories were told about this channel as part of a more extensive river system underneath the city of Birmingham. Early settlers were told stories by local Indians who spoke of an underground river that ran the valley's length. This legend seemed to grow with every telling. The springs had been diverted into channels in the appropriately named Spring Street that started at the park's gate. As the city around Avondale grew, the springs were directed to the stormwater drains running underneath Spring Street, what is now known as 41st Street. Peyton King owned the land around the spring and he sold it to the Avondale Land Company. Along with surrounding land, they incorporated the area as the city of Avondale, named after a Cincinnati, Ohio suburb, which had been named for the Avondale Parish in Scotland. As a condition of selling the land, King specified that the spring and the 40 acres around it would remain a public park. The area around the springs had been a popular picnic spot for early Birmingham residents for years. King's house was on the northwest corner of what would become Avondale Park. It was torn down and replaced with a Carnegie Library, one of the few in the Birmingham area. In 1961, the Carnegie Library was demolished and replaced with the current library building. The city would triple in size in the next decade, and Avondale was eventually annexed into the rapidly expanding Birmingham city limits. The area's primary industry was a textile mill founded in 1897 by future Governor B.B. B. Comer. It took its name from the fledgling city and was known as Avondale Mills for the next century until its closing in 2006. Avondale Park was for years the largest park in Birmingham. There were ball fields and a pavilion, and the big spring would fill a wading pool. The park was at the base of a steep hill and a villa was constructed on top. On the slope between the pond and the villa, the Works Projects Administration created an outdoor amphitheater. But what was most unique about the park in its early days was not all these attractions, but a small zoo. The first zoo in Birmingham was just a small collection of exotic animals located in the Birmingham Fire Station No. 3, located at Magnolia Park and 22nd Street. They moved it into Magnolia Park as the collection grew, now known as Brother Brian Park. In 1911, the animals from Magnolia Park and a group of animals at East Lake Park were all relocated to a new exhibit in Avondale Park. Over the years, the Avondale Zoo would house various animals including a bison, two cows, a llama, two black bears, foxes, wolves, coyotes, raccoons, and wildcats. There were monkeys, rabbits, swans, waterfowl, alligators, peacocks, hawks, owls, goats, and a supposedly eight-foot-long eastern diamondback rattlesnake named Dick. Area residents supplied the zoo with some of these animals. They were probably pets that had become unwieldy to handle. For instance, explorer Donald Beatty brought home a jaguar cub from his travels to the Amazon. Once the cub started to grow, he decided a zoo would be a better place to keep a wild animal. There were a wide variety of animals in the zoo, but from the beginning, officials had their eye on a larger marquee animal. The Hagenbeck Wallace Circus was a huge circus that toured the United States. At the time, it was the second largest circus next to Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey. When they visited Birmingham in 1912, 
Zoo officials inquired about purchasing an Asian elephant. Money was raised through civic promotions, and a kid's penny dry raised $500 towards the purchase. In November 1913, the zoo was ready. Birmingham Age Herald editor E.W. Barrett, Birmingham Park Director Frank Smith, and Park Commissioner James Wilson took the train to meet the circus in Tuscaloosa. Because where else in Alabama should you buy an elephant? After watching the show, Mr. Barrett chose a female elephant named Fanchon. Someone in Missouri, not the circus, owned Fanchon. So long-distance negotiations took place, and a $2,000 price was agreed upon. The money was wired to the owner, and the elephant was headed to Birmingham. Now, I thought it was curious that a third party owned the elephant and not the circus. But in March of that year, while the circus was at their winter headquarters in Peru, Indiana, the Great Flood of 1913 occurred. The circus tragically lost eight elephants, 21 lions and tigers, and eight performing horses in the floodwaters. Rival circuses came to their rescue and loaned them animals and equipment so they could get back on the road in April. Fanchon was taken to the train station, and after some deft maneuvering, she was loaded onto an l &N railway baggage car, breaking a light or two along the way. Circus handler Curly Hayes made the trip as well. He would make sure that Fanchon made it to Birmingham and that her new handler was well-trained for the job. While the name Fanchon might have been great in the circus, it doesn't roll off the tongue, and it's not the name you want your star attraction to be known. By the time she was delivered to Birmingham, they had changed her name to Miss Fancy. Miss Fancy's arrival in the city was quicker than expected, and a proper house for her was not yet completed at the zoo. She spent the first night at the Gypsy Smith Auditorium, located on 1st Avenue between 22nd and 23rd Street. The Birmingham Ad Club was holding a home product show, and Miss Fancy would make her debut to the community there. She would spend the night in the auditorium on mattresses donated by Perfection Mattress Company of Birmingham, an original sponsor of the event. The next day, Miss Fancy would visit the zoo. But first, she would call on H. Harold Building and editor E.W. Barrett before making her way along 20th Street to Five Point South. Miss Fancy would walk past the stately mansions on Highland Avenue, past Lakeview Park, and then on to Avondale Park. She would spend the day there before returning to the auditorium. Miss Fancy had one more home before her permanent home at the zoo was completed. The home product show had ended and the auditorium would be torn down. She received an invitation from the Peerless Lumber Company where she could stay in the heated building until she moved permanently to the zoo. The great thing about Miss Fancy was she was a trained circus performer. She was used to large crowds and screaming children. When she got to Birmingham, she was not fazed by the attention and the masses. Many pictures of Miss Fancy show this. There are photos of children at her feet and climbing on top of her as she lay on the ground. The kids loved it, and it seems Miss Fancy also loved the attention. John Todd would become her new trainer after Curly Hayes rejoined the circus. At the time, he was the only African-American elephant handler in the United States. Todd was responsible for feeding her and mucking out her pen. He would trim her toenails and tusks and give her plenty of exercise. They would often take five to ten mile walks through the surrounding neighborhood. The two would become very close. Miss Fancy weighed 1,800 pounds when she first came to the Avondale Zoo. When Todd left for a year's service in the Army during World War I, it greatly affected Miss Fancy. She was sad and wouldn't eat. By the time Todd returned, Miss Fancy only weighed 1,100 pounds. Once her appetite returned, a typical daily feeding for Miss Fancy included 175 pounds of hay, 45 gallons of oats, and 110 gallons of water. Now, as you can imagine, the fencing used to keep Miss Fancy in her pen is not the same as what is used at the Birmingham Zoo today. From time to time, Miss Fancy would tire of her pen and break out and explore the neighborhood. In one incident, she wandered off from the park and took a stroll on Overlook Road on the hill above the park. Frightened parents gathered curious children into homes and called the police. They found Miss Fancy grazing on shrubs and small trees in the yards of the neighborhood homes. All it took was for her caretaker, John Todd, to point her in the direction of the park, and they headed off together. There have been other stories of people opening the curtains of their homes only to see an elephant looking back at them through the window. 
I imagine it was exciting and terrifying all at the same time. When I had a dog who would never take his medicine, I always had to hide it in something he loved, like peanut butter. Miss Fancy was no different. When she needed to take medication, the only way she would take it was to mix it with whiskey. Now keep in mind that from 1920 on, prohibition was the law of the land. At the recommendation of a veterinarian, the city commission would donate whiskey confiscated by county prohibition agents. A quart or more of the whiskey would be required for each dose. Now all that whiskey would have been hard to ignore during the depths of prohibition, and we know that John Todd was human. From time to time, he would share the whiskey with Miss Fancy. We know this because Todd was arrested at least once for drunkenness. No word if they were able to arrest Miss Fancy as well. By the 1930s, the Depression had its grip on Birmingham and the nation. It was no longer feasible to fund and maintain a zoo, especially when one of your animals eats as much as Miss Fancy did. She was sold to the Cole Brothers Clyde Beatty Circus and renamed Frida. She is mentioned in the Circus Handbook from 1934 as the circus prepared for the winter circuit. New animals were arriving, including Frida, a giant elephant from Birmingham, Alabama, who towered over the other three in the elephant row. Frida tips the scales at 8,600 pounds. It would be another two decades before the people of Birmingham would see elephants outside of the circus. They would not have a zoo until the Birmingham Zoo, located on the other side of Red Mountain in Shades Valley, opened in 1955. Miss Fancy might have left Avondale in 1934, but her legend continues. She was referenced in a couple of books, notably Fanny Flagg's Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe. She is also remembered fondly in the resurgent Avondale community. A statue of Miss Fancy is located at Avondale Park. There was a restaurant called Fancy's on 5th, and the Avondale Brewing Company, which is one of the first businesses to move back into the community, uses Miss Fancy as an icon. So what became of Miss Fancy? According to one source, she died 20 years later in 1954 in Buffalo, New York. If that's correct, she would have been in her 80s, which is very old for an elephant. I am proud to announce that the book Alabama Short Stories Volume 1 is now available at Amazon.com. It features the first three season stories of the podcast in book form. It's a perfect gift for that friend or family member who just doesn't want to listen to a podcast. It's also great for podcast fans who want pictures with their stories. And it's a perfect gift for that hard to buy person in your life. You know who they are. Now get them the book. It's available as paperback, hardback, or Kindle version. Not only will it make your life better, but it will help us to continue to produce this podcast. It's a win-win. You can find a link at alabamashortstories.com or search Alabama Short Stories on amazon.com. Order yours today.